So thank you for everybody who's um, tuned into this. I uh, wanted to give just a, a little bit of, of advice while we can't do it face to face um, about things we can all do to help ourselves. So this is the sort of standard health talk that I do um, in the clinic. But I've, I think I said on the video that I did earlier that um, I'd listened to a podcast um, by some guys called The Gut Geek. and um, this really interesting stuff. So I'm going to sort of summarize what they've said about um, the gut bacteria and things we can do to improve our immune function uh, via that as well. So if we get started with the first slide. So this is um, entitled what happens when you get injured. Now, most people when they come in to see us, the big question is how long is it going to take for uh, me to get better? What we've done here is to outline the main stages that happen um, when you get an injury. You have the acute inflammation, which lasts up to 72 hours. And then we go into the proliferation phase, which lasts six to eight weeks. And then we get the remodeling phase, which lasts between three and 12 months. Um, the proliferation phase is, um, well, the, the acute phase is where you get the a lot of swelling comes into the area so fluid comes into the area the immune system starts to come into the area and you get that character characteristic redness around the injury site obviously if the injury is deeper in more of a uh, a deep muscle or bone then you don't get to see that but if it was say a cut on your finger you would see that characteristic redness coming out that's the phase that happens within the first 72 hours then the proliferation phase the analogy i always use is it's like your body if you um took a, a sledgehammer to a, a wall and, and smashed through it. The proliferation phase is where your body is um, putting perhaps some boarding across it, just trying to make it relatively structurally sound again. Um, and then when you get to the remodeling phase, that's when that area is, um, the tissue is repaired back to the way it was. You would either be putting uh, the, the finishing plaster and paintwork on the area, um, if you're following my analogy. But it's the remodeling phase that then can take up to 12 months. So when when people say to me, "How long will it take to get better?" There is a um, oh sorry, I've got one. It, there there is a, a massive um, variation in how long it can all take, and more often than not, we are looking around the three month mark for the majority of things. But if it is uh, more of a chronic issue, it can take a lot longer. And the, the key thing here is if you look at the bottom of the slide where it says end of healing or chronic inflammation, if we are not changing the habits and the things that brought about the injury in the first place, if we're not adapting our posture position, our load on areas, then it very often does go back to that acute inflammation and the cycle continues. And um, so it's so important to change factors about our life. And that's where the education comes in. And that's what we try to give a lot at the clinic is education on how you can change your lifestyle to improve things so you don't get into this chronic inflammatory cycle. Um, if we, the next slide, into here. Now I'm gonna, st I'm gonna sort of stop it there slightly and go into this, um, podcast try and summarize it a little because it feeds in with the inflammation side of things quite well um a lot of the time when we talk about gut bacteria it's often or bacteria in general is often vilified as being something that that's not good for us but actually we have quite a symbiotic relationship with uh with bacteria especially in the gut and although um but it's all about the balance and variety. So what the, the um, gut geek guys were saying is that the biggest issue that, that we have for our gut bacteria is the use of antibiotic. Now, they're not saying that you should never take an antibiotic. But sometimes it can be life saving, but it's the it was the over reliance and particularly um, before when when um, medics were giving out uh, antibiotics a lot more readily, there were far more issues with um, the the microbiome that the um, quality of the gut bacteria that we had, and they started off by saying that actually the the bacteria that we have in our guts and the quality of that bacteria is um, seeded from the very start when when you're a baby and actually the birthing process as the baby passes through the birthing canal um it actually picks up some of that bacteria from the mother 
Um, so that's where this all begins. And then through things like breastfeeding, um, again, it reinforces the right type of bacteria in, in the gut. And um, they were saying that even the, during the different stages of breastfeeding, as the months continue, the mix of oligosaccharides, which are a relatively complicated mixture of sugars, um, but they act as a prebiotic, so that, that's the sort of substance that helps to feed the good gut bacteria. But actually in breastfeeding, as the months continue, the type of oligosaccharides that we have or food for the bacteria changes alongside um, the, uh, the, the baby's development. So breastfeeding is a huge thing that helps to seed the, the bacteria in the right way. Um, and then they were talking about things that, that obviously affect um, badly, processed foods in particular. And um, again, the, the guys were based in America, so they were talking a lot about it there. But the, the processed foods that we have generally are pretty devoid of most nutrients. So they're not a good thing for our overall health. But particularly from a bacteria point of view, it definitely promotes the bad type of bacteria that we don't want. So making sure that you are eating fresh but, um, fruit and vegetables and things that you are cooking at home makes a massive difference to the quality of bacteria that we have in our guts. And eating things like um, uh, the, the sort of what they call live foods, things like sauerkraut and um, fermented foods are fantastic for helping to create the right kind of um, uh, gut bacteria and maintain it. But they were saying that between 70 and 80 percent of our immune system actually comes from the gut and the gut bacteria. And even when you go back to the inflammation that I was talking about earlier, it's actually our immune system that helps us to repair. So it's, again, immune system often is, is thought of as just about fighting bugs and viruses and bacteria, but, but actually the, the immune system is the thing that helps us to repair from injury too. So if you've got 70 or 80% of your immune system is being, um, created and helped by having the right mix of microbiome and gut bacteria then it's a hugely important thing that we probably don't as a culture tend to focus on very much um, so and, and that needs that needs addressing but um, they went then went on to talk about the impact of gut bacteria and even weight increase and they they, they cited some studies uh, with mice that have been done and although obviously there is not a total carryover um, to human physiology, there is there are some uh, characteristics um, that are similar, so you can create some kind of correlation. But what they found is that mice who were lean compared to mice who were obese, they had different types of gut bacteria. And when they took the gut bacteria from the obese me, obese mice, and actually put that into the lean mouse or mice, um, they gained weight in the same way as the obese ones had. So they showed a causal relationship between the type of gut bacteria we have and increasing weight. So from a weight loss point of view, our gut bacteria is also hugely important. If you're lethargic, if you don't sleep well, even some mental health issues have been associated with poor gut microbiome. Um, and the reason for the, the increase in, in weight, they were saying, is because that the bad gut bacteria tends to actually break down the food even more. So you're almost extracting more calories from the food um, than you would from the sort of uh, better um, gut bacteria. The problem with increased weight as well is it's known that it increases the production of um, in what they call interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, tumor necrosis factor, which is actually a pro-inflammatory thing. So we know that with people, who, obese people, that actually have more inflammation in their bodies than um, people who are leaner. So again, going back to our slides on acute inflammation, if you have a poor gut microbiome, which leads to increased weight and obesity, then that actually increases inflammation. So you're not going to heal from injuries as quickly or as well as you could if you didn't have that. So the three main kind of takeaways from this podcast I listened to was to minimize antibiotic use to only times that were really important, um, to eat whole foods that you cooked at home and to reduce starchy foods because again, they tend to feed that bad bacteria and minimize sugar consumption, which again, feeds that bad bacteria. So they were the three kind of take homes. I hope you found that interesting, but definitely I would suggest look at the Gut Geeks um, on, they're, they're on Instagram and Facebook, um, they have a website too, but it's really, I, I found it really fascinating um, podcast to listen to. So.
highly recommend you take a look at it. Right, so going back to our regular slides, pain and emotions. Um, again, it's, it's known, it's been known for quite a while that how we feel on the whole can have a massive impact on the amount of pain that our body feels. And sometimes that can be misconstrued that it's all in my head. And I've had patients come in um, from GPs and other places where they've said, oh yeah, the, the guy told me that, oh, it's all in my head, it's nothing, sort of go away. And, and that's not what we're saying through this slide at all. You have a physical tissue damage, but your body, based on your um, state of mind, can certainly augment or increase the amount of pain or decrease the amount of pain that you're feeling from that physiology. And that again is why pain is so subjective. Um, one person, if, if I have one, uh, two, pe two people in with, with a, a disc issue in their back, one person might rate it, which, which if you scanned them was exactly the same state of structural uh, injury, you would say that one person could report a five out of 10 pain, whereas another person reports an eight out of 10 pain. Um, and we know that things like cognitive behavioral therapy and other mindfulness meditation, those things are very, very good at helping people with chronic pain. But if we look at this slide, there's, um, there's this thing called the pain gate theory. And um, where the, uh, you probably see where it says slow C fibers injury, you have this area in the spinal cord where the pain then goes up towards the brain and that's a perception of pain. But what you can see is that this area that says inhibitory to descending pathway. And that is where, if we're in a good frame of mind, there is more inhibitory descending signals that are coming down to the spinal cord and actually dampening or reducing the amount of pain fibers or signals that are going up to your brain. So we can actively reduce the amount of pain that we're feeling based on our emotions. And then conversely, if you were in a, if you were quite if you're in quite a bad anxious place depressed that sort of thing we don't have so much descending pathways coming down so that level of pain increases um so as i say practicing things like mindfulness meditation cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy are all fantastic at helping to increase the amount of descending inhibitory signals and and therefore reduce the amount of pain that we feel when we get an injury now, a common question that I get is, what is a slipped disc? And the first thing I say is it hasn't slipped because it's, a, it's an inaccurate term. The discs physically cannot slip out of place. What happens is we have four different stages, as you can see on here. The first one is just a basic degeneration phase. And you can see that there are two parts to a disc. You have the inner part, which is that lighter colored, that's called the nucleus. And then the outer part of the disc, um, the sort of purple color is called the annular fibers. And what happens due to repetitive poor movement patterning or strain is that the outer annular fibers have these microscopic tears. Now in the degeneration uh, stage, you can see that the nucleus is still fairly well maintained. There's a minor bulge, but it's not really going anywhere. The second stage of prolapse is where that, um, that hair becomes slightly wider and bigger, again, because of the, the um, rep repetition of poor movement. Um, and that widening allows the nuclear part, nucleus part of the disc to push out and it creates more of a bulge. So when most people come in and say, I've got a slip disc or have I got a slip disc, what they're really referring to is this prolapse phase. Um, and that tends to be the stage where we will get people with symptoms going down into their legs, a typical sciatica, uh, because of the way that the, the lumbar spine in particular, it's, it's in a, a C-shaped curve, it's called a lordosis. And because of the shape of that low back curve, when a disc, when the pressure comes onto the disc, it forces the material backwards, which is where obviously the nerves are coming out of the spine. So this prolapse is where we'll often start to see people with symptoms into the legs, ridiculous symptoms. Then we start to get to an extrusion where that inner material has broken through completely into the annular fiber, part through the annular fibers. And then we have the last stage of sequestration, which is where part of the nuclear material has actually broken off and is almost 
you don't like to say floating, but it's movable within the, um, the, the spinal cord. And that is a pretty nasty stage to be in. Um, the, these, the extrusion and sequestration phases, people don't just recover naturally from that. They will nearly always need some kind of surgical approach to help to um, reduce the material uh, back into where it came from, uh, uh, back from where it came from. The, the degeneration and prolapse, we often, as a manual therapist, whether you're a chiropractor, physio, or osteopath, we are able to manage that kind of um, herniation. And in 99% of cases, we get good resolution of symptoms. It often will take three to four months for it to resolve well and to become strong again. But the, the key thing really is the ongoing um, exercise rehabilitation of the back. Once we've got them to the point where they're not in pain and we've got that inflammation down, the exercises are hugely important. So the first two phases we can help with very well. In extrusion or sequestration, often they do need to have um, uh, some kind of surgical approach. But no, you will not have a slip disc. Now, if we go to the next slide, ligament creep. Now, this is a a process, and I think most people, if you look at that picture, most people will be able to relate to it. Um, if you haven't been in that posture yourself, I'm sure you've seen lots of people that have. The ligaments um, that I've highlighted, there's the an anterior longitudinal ligament, and then there's the posterior longitudinal ligament. A very thick ligament that connects the bone, each of the um, bones. Actually, we've got one here. Okay. Okay, hi tabs. We're part way through, but you can um, you can jump in, mate. Um, so yeah, so I'm talking about the, the ligaments. Now, ligaments attach bone to bone, and the the two that we're highlighting here, the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament, they are very very thick ligaments that are designed to keep the integrity of the spinal column in, in place. Um, they're really ligaments are really the last line of defence for maintaining the integrity of the joint. Once the muscle um, is no longer able to provide the support it should, um, then you do start to rely on the ligaments. And um, ligament creep is a process by which the ligaments microscopically lengthen. Um, after 20 to 30 minutes of being sat in the position that you can see this guy in at the computer, your ligaments will undergo creep which therefore means that the bones are not being held as tightly as they should, um, which therefore means you have to rely more on the muscles to, um, to provide the support. And in the short term, that's okay. But again, most people fatigue um, from a muscle point of view. So you do need the ligaments to provide, to do a proper job, which means that we need to be better with our posture. And I, I can't stress enough that I don't, People should not be acting like the Tin Man. We should never be bolt upright and not able to flex and move. Our spine is incredibly designed to be mobile and to move, but it's not designed to be stuck in these sorts of postures that we see people in day in, day out in your car or sat at your computer. So we need to think a little better about what we're doing with our bodies. And that's why things like sit to stand desks are fantastic because you can spend 20 to 30 minutes sat down and then raise it up and, and do the same there. But if you have somebody, um, I have somebody that comes in that, that doesn't have that function of their desk or is, say, having to um, drive a lot for work and stuck in a poor posture, then, then this process happens and it can create a lot of problems. Um, the posterior longitudinal ligament that goes at the back, that abuts the back of the discs. So, again, it provides a lot of stability to the back part of the disc. Now, with the herniation, in most cases, a herniation goes backwards into the side because of the presence of this thick posterior longitudinal ligament. So if the integrity of that ligament is compromised, then it does leave the disc more vulnerable. But as I say, the key is trying to make sure that we're changing our postural position regularly. And I don't even think that, um, that standing for long periods is good. Um, we need to be changing position regularly in order to reduce the likelihood that we'll adopt poor postural positions standing or sitting and therefore help to reduce the stress on these ligaments. Now there's an exercise that I really like. It's called the um, Brugger relief position or Brugger exercise. Um, I get a lot of office workers to do this one. 
So as you can see, the lady is um, stood up or, or um, has got a really good posture through the spine. Now, a way that I tend to get people to think about it is imagine you've got a piece of string that's going from the top of your chest up to the ceiling and it's lifting you up, it's tugging you up. A lot of the time when I, um, when I talk to people about posture, they almost feel like they need to be pulling the shoulders very, very hard backwards and maintaining that almost military type of posture, but it's not the case. Your muscles between your shoulder blades are not designed to be that active for long, long periods of time. And it, it also has an impact on the centration of your shoulder joints. So it's not good to be feeling like you should, you're really tugging hard and pulling hard backwards. So think more about what's happening with the chest, that you're taking it from sort of a slouch forward position like that, little tug up and you're there. That also you'll feel it's rotating the lumbar spine, the low back, so it's putting that into a good position. And the further upright you are here, that also helps to put the neck into the right place. You feel it on yourself if you drop forwards through the chest if that goes down your head naturally then goes forwards now the head weighs eight to ten kilos so you're looking at the um the, the the leverage purposes on the neck with the head being forwards and that creates much more of a strain on the muscles at the back of the neck than if you're in this position upright with the head centered properly on the neck and on the shoulders so this bruger exercise start by doing that lifting up slightly there now you can see she's got the theraband wrapped around her hands so have the um, your elbows tucked nicely into your side with the uh, theraband around the hands and then you're slowly rotating the arms out to the side and then back in and it's a rotational movement it's not lifting the arms rotating out to the side and back and 10 repetitions of that if you if you spend a lot of time at a computer um or say if you did do a lot of driving, if you were able just to do this a couple of times a day, 10 repetitions, it really does help just to bring the back into a better position, relieve some of that stress on the ligaments and um, get the muscles functioning better. So highly recommend this as a, a very simple exercise to do if you are at your best. Um, to talk a little bit about posture position if you are having to spend a lot of time at your best. There are a few key things that I always say to people. Now, the upper, if we look at the, the monitor first, the upper third of the monitor, if you're sat in that good postural position, lifting up slightly from the chest, the upper third of the monitor should be directly in your eye line. Now, the biggest issue is if you're using laptops, because most people um, are not connecting into a larger monitor and keyboard, so they are looking down far more at the laptop than they should be. So I always try and uh, suggest that people use a, a desktop instead. But I say upper third, directly in your eye line. Then if we look at the chair, this is some probably some of the most important bits with it. If you, you should be able to get your chair properly underneath the desk so that you are not having to lean forwards. Because if you're, say in this example, if the armrests are stopping you get getting close into it that of course then causes you to lean forwards to have to use the mouse and the keyboard so you're encouraging this forward drawn posture through the shoulders the chest is rounding in the head therefore comes forwards so making sure you can get the chair underneath it if your armrests prevent you from getting underneath properly take them off if you can't lower them enough to get underneath just take the armrests off you don't need it um, the two other things to look at is the lumbar support, the back rest of the um, chair. Often I see that most chairs actually, certainly office type chairs, have a decent enough lumbar support, but most of the time people don't have it in the right place. So often um, the lumbar support, the, the apex of that lumbar support is often too low. You really want that apex to be almost feeling like it's coming just underneath your lower ribs. If you can get into that position, then it's in the right sort of place. The other thing to look at is the base of the chair. In an ideal world, we would have the base of the chair tilting slightly forwards, only around a five to 10 degree angle, but that helps to rotate the hips forwards. It brings the hips higher than the knees, rotates them forwards, which again helps to maintain that really nice lumbar spine position and help to support the disc as much as we can. It's one of the big reasons why people with disc injuries don't uh, do too well sat in their cars often, because in most cases, unless it's like a four by four where it's a slightly 
um, a better angle on the seat. In most cases, you look at a car seat and it's higher at the front and slopes backwards, which rotates the hips backwards. It flexes the lumbar spine and creates more of a compressive load in the discs and forces that material backwards towards the nerves. So, um, as I say, people with pre-existing disc issues don't often do too well in, in car seats. Now, again, I want to say that it's not... Um, if you do these things once or twice, you are not going to get a disc herniation by sitting in a bad position once or twice. It's just not going to happen. You have to be, a, you have to fatigue and create enough stress on the disc cumulatively that it eventually weakens and allows that disc material to herniate. I don't want people to, to start worrying that you or thinking that, as I say, you have to be in this incredible posture all day, every day. You don't. But because we're creatures of habit, most people will sit on the same seat of the sofa. But you sit on the same seat on the sofa, lean down onto the armrest if it's one side. And then you do that every day, every evening for the next six months, 12 months, however long, you start to then create these little distortions in the muscles. Some will start to tighten, some weaken, pressure goes onto the discs in other ways. So it's not, it, it's something to be mindful of that we want to be looking to change postural positions and make sure we're not loading our spines and our bodies in exactly the same way all the time. That's really the take home from this. Ideal sleeping position. Um, so it's usually at this point I ask, does anybody sleep on their, their, their front? It's definitely not a good idea to be sleeping on your front because you look at it, you rotate the neck to the side, it then gets pushed backwards and you create more of a hyperextension through the low back. So front sleeping is not a great idea. The best positions really are side sleeping or sleeping on your back. However, again, a lot of people um, don't do too well laying on their back um, from a back perspective, but also from a snoring perspective. But uh, so side sleeping is definitely the best way. Now, if you look at the, the, um, the diagram, the lady has got her knees bent up slightly and they are together. That's the key. Again, when I speak to a lot of people about sleeping, they say that they'll have the bottom leg straight and the top leg is bent, but it comes forwards from the lower leg. That creates a rotation through the low back which again, if you did it for a short period, is not a problem, but most people will be doing it for a reasonable period of time at night. And the problem is, is your low back joints, the facet joints, are only able to rotate one to two degrees per segment. So for the whole lumbar spine, you only have around five degrees of rotation. The lumbar spine is not designed to rotate. It's designed to flex and extend, but not rotate. The mid back is, um, the mid back is the main area it's designed to rotate smoothly. So that's where we need most rotation to happen. But I'm sort of getting distracted here. So yeah, try to make sure the knees are bent together, 90 degree position or slightly under. And if you need to, if, if it's painful to do that, um, to have the knees together, then just tuck the duvet between or have a pillow between your knees. And that's a very, very comfortable, nice position for your spine and for your pelvis. Now onto the, um, the main things I, the main ones I recommend to help with sleep is the Sealy mattress you can see on the left and then the raw rest pillow on the right hand side. The Sealy mattress that I recommend to people is the um, hybrid version and that is a pocket sprung at the bottom and then it has a gel tech layer on top that they call it. Um, and it is, it's, uh, sorry, it's called gel tech, but it's a latex material. It stays a little cooler than memory foam does, which is really nice, but it gives you that nice density change between the firm springs and then it adds a little bit of a softening into the top um, layer. So definitely the Sealy, highly recommend you have a look at those if you are looking to change a mattress. And it's something that you really should look to do every eight to 10 years. Most mattresses don't last much longer than that and still have a good level of support. So if you're getting to that point, um, then do look to change it. It, make, it can make a massive difference to how well you sleep. The, um, the raw rest pillows, what you can see with the guy is if, you, if you're laying on your side, you have two different um, heights of curvature and they're designed to support the neck, at maintaining that straight neutral spine. Um, obviously dependent on the, um, the distance between the tip of the shoulder and your neck, um, will dictate which side of the raw rest pillow you, you're going to use but it's fantastic and I always recommend that you get a shaped pillow like this rather than a flat one. I don't like 
um, most feather pillows because they're just far too compressible. Um, and even the some of the, the, the even the flat temper ones you used to be able to I don't know if you can still get them, but they were flat temper pillows. I I just don't like them. They don't give you the same support as the sort of raw rest ones do. They're fantastic. And if you're laying on your back, then it also helps to push up into the neck and maintain that lordotic T-shaped curve, which it should have. So raw rest, fantastic, and Sealy mattress is brilliant. Um, next slide healthy bending now there are lots of different strategies that we can utilize to bend um, and it's, it's definitely going to be dependent on the person because if you have um, uh, knee um, if you've had a knee operation knee replacement or if you have arthritic knees then I'm often not going to suggest that somebody bends uh, as the lady's doing on the left hand side using a lunge position of definitely be suggesting um, some alternatives but as a general if if you're um, quite healthy and no no major issues through the hips and knees these are the two strategies that I always suggest to people you can see the lady on the left you're not able to lift things in a, a really heavy things particularly well with a lunge position that's reserved more for a nice squat position or deadlift position as the lady on the right is doing but on the left you can see she's maintaining a very nice straight back and she's really utilizing the hips and the core muscles in order to lift the weight from the floor and then get moving. Often um, it was always advised by a lot of um, healthy lifting in, in, um, through health and safety was uh, certainly in the workplace they always advise people to bend their knees and as an initiation of movement that's not right your knee is a relatively simple hinge joint that is maintained its integrity is maintained through, maintained through ligaments and muscles it's not as strong as your hip joints it's a big ball and socket joint it's built for stability and strength and power you've got big glute max muscles around it in order to help create extension and drive power through it so i always say to people you should be using your hips more than your knees and the lady on the right hand side doing the deadlift, you can see that she's really bending. She's getting right into the um, hip socket. The knees are bending, of course they are, but most of the bend is coming through the, through the hips and she's maintaining that really nice straight low back position. So um, it's always about using the hips over the knees and then definitely not using the back too much. Certainly you're creating too much flexion through the back. There are some exercises, um, that we can um, send over to try and help with that so if you are having problems contact me um, and i'll send some things over but most of the time the movement and most of the load should go through the hips not through the knees i think this is going to be the last slide so yeah so most of the time as i said when people come to see us initially they are in this left hand side area of the diagram the chart where they're in pain and suffering um, where they're acutely inflamed, sometimes chronically inflamed, but most of the time it's acute inflamed tissue and we're helping people to reduce that inflammation, um, start to build capacity back into the tissue and get them feeling better. They then hit this point where it says decision time. Um, when they're generally feeling better, there's no subjective pain being felt and they feel like they're pretty much back to normal. You then have two decisions and what i would implore people to do is to make sure that you are keeping up doing the exercises that we give you and any advice that we give you as well that will help you to then start to travel onwards and upwards as the chart goes into this sort of green area but optimization of health is more where we're interested in i i, I love getting people out of pain and i love helping people get back to their normal life but it pains me when i see somebody who will then as soon as they feel better they stop doing their exercises they stop any kind of supportive care and they just go back to the old habits and the way they were and then i could pretty much put a bet on it six months down the line they'll be coming back in for more acute care because they've gone back to the way the way they were and it's really sad because there's so much that you can do to help yourselves and that's what we're here for but i would always always say to anybody listening to this make sure that you carry on with your exercises if you're given advice nutritional advice or joining a pilates class continuing to do any with a personal trainer whatever it might be but building up your strength capacity and and your health it's worth it um, beyond all belief it's worth it so got any questions i'm going to go up to the um chat section now I'm just get that up. 
So if anybody has any questions, I don't know how much time, because we're stuck to um, 40 minutes on here. But if anybody has any questions, please do pop it into the chat section um, and I'll answer anything I can. Yeah, we've got about two or three minutes or so.